Hello and welcome to this presentation, working out the futures hedge ratio. In this presentation, we're going to look at some of the issues associated with determining the number of futures contracts required to hedge a particular long or short underlying position. But it's worth mentioning up front, of course, that a futures contract is standardised in terms of the quantity of the underlying asset to be delivered, the location in the world where delivery might take place. And, and of course, this is particularly relevant for contracts, say, based upon things like coffee, cocoa, oil, etc. And also the quality of the underlying asset, which is to be chosen for delivery. Futures contracts allow a wide range of different assets often to be delivered into a futures contract. Now, we'll see later on how the final futures price is adjusted to reflect the differences in, for instance, location, quality, and also timing, because futures contracts often also allow the seller of the futures contract to decide when, in a particular delivery month, they choose to deliver, whether it's the first business day of the month or the last. So when you work out the number of futures contracts required to hedge a particular underlying asset, we need to determine what the nominal value of the underlying asset exposure is, and then we divide that by the set value of one futures contract. So really, hedging is a balancing act. We need to determine how many futures to buy or sell in order to hedge a specific underlying asset risk. So the simple hedge ratio then is the value of the underlying asset divided by the value of one futures contract. For example, let's suppose we wish to hedge, say, 10 million nominal worth of government bonds. If we assume that in this particular example, the value of one futures contract is based upon 100,000 nominal bonds, then the hedge ratio is 100 futures. Of course, we could also be using this formula to work out the hedge ratio for, say, 10 million worth of a particular commodity and assume that the value of the futures contract is 100,000 nominal. However, with futures contracts, the issue often presented for the, the potential hedger is what happens if you wish to hedge for a non-futures delivery day. Often, hedgers have exposure dates that don't coincide neatly with that of the futures day. And this leads to significant uh, mismatches. Additionally, the quality of the underlying asset, which the hedger may be holding, may not necessarily coincide with the quality assumed into the futures contract. And this can create mismatches as well, often referred to as basis risk. Also, sometimes the asset in which we're hedging isn't um, neatly divisible by the unit of trading of the futures contract. So you can end up with slightly more futures contracts or slightly less than would otherwise be required. And again, this is part of what we call basis risk. So these are issues that we have to bear in mind when hedging with futures contracts. Of course, there are ways in which we can fine tune the futures hedge ratio. If we're familiar with the idea of the capital asset pricing model and the concept of beta, we know that we can determine the beta of the asset in which we want to hedge and then adjust the fine futures contract by that amount. So it's a relative volatility calculation that we're interested in here. When talking about interest rate products, there's also the concept of basis point value or DVO1, which we can use. Often those values are determined from the concept of duration. And essentially what we're doing here is just fine tuning the futures hedge ratio to make the hedge outcome slightly more accurate. But nonetheless, it's not absolutely perfect. And we are subject to what's called basis risk in life of the futures contract, which will need to be monitored. Now, as we've mentioned, the seller of the futures contract has a choice when it comes to deciding when to deliver the futures contract. And this can sometimes be at the beginning of a particular delivery month or in the middle or at the end. Sellers of futures contracts can also choose where in the world they may wish to deliver. And this could be, for example, in a port in Rotterdam or San Paolo or Singapore, for instance. And the futures contract also allows a choice of underlying asset to be delivered where the quality of the underlying asset can be varied. And of course, we know with respect to the world's crops, the quality 
can vary enormously depending upon where the crop is grown in a particular part of the world. We can also look at commodities like oil. We know that crude oil varies enormously, whether it's derived from the North Sea, Texas in America, the Middle East or in Russia. And also financial uh, futures contracts, for example, say based on government bonds, there is a choice often of government bonds that can be delivered into a futures contract where the coupon and the remaining maturity of the bond uh, varies. So this has to be taken into consideration, particularly from the buyer of the futures contract's perspective. The buyer of the futures contract knows that there is a range of different assets then that can be delivered. And this may affect their ability uh, or their decision as to whether they want to hedge in the first place, but if they do decide to hedge, whether they want to hedge right through to maturity day. So it does again raise this question as to what exactly is the futures price actually tracking? Well, the futures price can track the asset which is most likely to be delivered by the seller. And this introduces us to the concept which we'll discuss in a moment called the concept of the cheapest to deliver. Now, if at delivery the seller of the futures contract chooses a particular asset from a list of assets to be delivered into the contract in a particular part of the world on a particular delivery day, then clearly the adjustments have to be made to take, this, to take these differences into consideration. So the final futures price is adjusted to reflect this. And of course, this is the, um, the idea that the buyer of the futures contract will either pay slightly more or less to get delivery of a specific a particular asset. So in summary then, the seller of the futures contract has a number of choices in terms of timing, location and quality of the underlying asset. This creates a disadvantage in a sense for the buyer of the futures contract. However, the buyer of the futures contract needs to be uh, compensated somehow. So adjustments on futures delivery day are included in order to reflect these differences and thereby um, ultimately um, making the delivery process uh, totally equitable. So we know then that the seller of the futures contract has a number of choices in which to implement when it comes to delivery and therefore the buyer has to anticipate the seller's preferences. So this leads us to the concept of the cheapest deliver idea that the seller, being rational, would want to deliver the asset which best suits them and it's going to be one which is cheapest for them potentially to get hold of and to deliver into the futures contract. Now this may mean that the buyer of the futures contract may not be happy with the prospects of delivery in terms of the quality of the underlying asset or where in the world or indeed uh, which time of the month delivery may be initiated by the seller. So it's no surprise then that uh, often buyers of futures contracts will hedge for a given period of time and as they approach the delivery period they will elect to close out their futures contracts because they do not wish to take delivery via the futures contracts because maybe the asset or the, the location in which the assets can be delivered is not to their liking. Instead, what the buyer of the futures contract would do is simply close out the futures contract before delivery day and go into the local market of their choice and take delivery of the asset there. The futures contract would still provide them with substantial protection in terms of variation margin but of course it may not be perfect and this is what we sometimes refer to as basis risk in the hedge. Now there are ways in which you can manage this basis risk and that's the subject of a presentation a little bit later on which we'll look at.